is sex, drugs, and rock and roll is... Uh, well, you're beyond that. Some of that's still in there, I think. <laughs> um, I'm afraid that's still there. I mean, I think that rock and roll is still very much about sexuality. I think the audience, or, you know, still takes a lot of drugs. And um, rock and roll, you have to deliver. And no one delivers rock and roll like the Rolling Stones. With every album and tour, this group sets a new benchmark for rock music. Each time they come back to the stage, they do it more successfully than anyone before. Yet, what initially created the most attention this time was not the size of their show or the quality of their music. It was their age. Jagger is 51. Drummer Charlie Watts, 53. Guitarist Ron Wood is 47. And Keith Richards is 50. Why is it that you attract so much attention about the age question when so many others have done it? No rock and roll bands have done it, but... I think that's exactly why, because they've only ever seen young cats do it. And, and in a way, I mean, I guess what we're trying to do is say, well, maybe we can bust that myth, that age thing. The only problem I have is the aches and pains you sometimes get. But this, this keeps you going. This gets you over that. Charlie Watts likes his role as an elder statesman of rock and roll. Was it more fun before? Is it more fun now? I think it's more fun now. The worst period of being a Rolling Stone, funnily enough, for me, was when girls used to scream at you. Because they used to embarrass me like mad. I could never, ever see what they were screaming at. I, I, I've never really been that great a teenager, young man sort of thing, I don't think. And I was, uh, I quite like being like this, really. But I don't know if I'll be doing it on this level when I'm 70, I don't think so. I think there is a time where we're gonna look uh, a bit silly doing it. Actually, they thought that time would come by age 30, and none of them expected rock and roll would ever be a career. Yet through four decades, the Rolling Stones have managed to stay on the cutting edge of popular music. But it hasn't been easy. There are fundamental differences between the group's two creative forces and songwriters. Jagger, the jet-setting man of self-described wealth and taste, and Richards, the quintessential rock and roll outlaw. By the 1980s, they were so sick of each other, it looked like the Rolling Stones were history. They didn't perform in concert together for seven years. Although friends since childhood, the Jagger-Richards partnership was on the rocks. How are you different? Mick uh, like, has, uh, likes to protect himself a lot from everything. He's always looking for an angle on people but i can't live like that you know i'd rather take somebody on face value until they screw up and it makes it difficult for me sometimes to get through to me because i want i know that he's wondering what my angle is <laughs> and, it, I, we, and that was where we hit the crunch but at the same time we've grown up with each other i mean i met him you know, in a sand pit <laughs> four years old <on. laughs> i can't divorce him he can't divorce me <laughs> but you both have tried well, he tried. <laughs> I think everyone was very aggravated, and I think everyone was a bit bored with it, to be honest. But I don't think anyone wants to really admit that. And they sort of took it out on each other, they said, we have to do this, and we're fed up with it, and whatever. And I think, in, a, in the end, that it was a good thing to take a break from it. Because we came back, I think, better than before. And bigger. Oh, we're going to go to places where we've never been. We're going to go to Mexico. Then we're going to Asia. We're going to, to Chile, I think. Uh, Brazil. On this world tour, only their second since 1982, 
The Rolling Stones are a state-of-the-art mobile corporation moving from city to city and country to country with almost 300 employees. It's only rock and roll, but it's big business. So big it sometimes surprises guitarist Ron Wood. This is a musical association, the band playing yeah. together. But it's also a business association. It is. And we're all very surprised when we have business meetings. We all kind of look at each other like, wow, you mean there's money too, loads of money? How much money? Promoter Michael Cole guaranteed the Stones a profit of $100 million to do the tour. And they expect to make much more, even though it takes a million dollars a week to keep the show on the road. He says Jagger, who spent his college days at the London School of Economics, makes his investment a safe bet. I tended to have relationships with artists that talked about the shows, and the business was left to be dealt with with the manager. And you almost never got an artist who would actually sit down and talk to you about the business aspects, whereas Mick is very involved in those details. Hey, nice to meet you. Jagger is so involved in the details, Business Week magazine labeled him the chief executive officer of the Rolling Stones, a rock and roll corporation. It's what they call in business a virtual corporation. A virtual corporation? <laughs> it's a kind of new thing which lasts for a year, makes a huge gross, makes hopefully a good profit. But then you just fold it all up and the organization disappears. <laughs> Yeah, it's on a really huge scale. Um, it's still sort of four white blokes from England playing American music, I think. In fact, American blues and jazz were the genesis of the Rolling Stones sound. When their tour reached New Orleans, the birthplace of jazz, it was a chance for the Stones to sample the local product almost every night. Keith Richards and Charlie Watts went to see a local blues band at a small neighborhood bar. Mick Jagger and Watts joined a traditional New Orleans jazz parade. Let's go, Mick, let's go. Let's go. And Jagger was right at home in the second line. Despite the due given jazz and blues by the Rolling Stones, it's the spectacle of Mick Jagger's superstar persona that gets the most attention. I've been holding on so long, I've been sleeping all along, and I've been you. It's an image that's outrageous, controversial, and carefully crafted. Doing the outfits and makeup and all that, it helps you get into the personality mm -hmm. that you're going to be, mm -hmm. that, you know, you're going to project on the stage. And the dominant trait of Jagger's stage personality is unabashed sexuality. I pushed the sexuality thing was quite a long way in this. I spread it in as many different ways as I could. But there's always been this, this sort of aura around you well you know androgyny and well yeah when you're young you is a time that you are rather androgynous looking and that's a whole thing of um, classical literature and painting and that was something that resurfaced with um, rock and roll in a big way but that's I think something for when you're young and um, I don't think that that really continues when you get older because you, you de define yourself more. Now, you were talking at dinner the other night about oh, skirts. Oh, I was joking, didn't yeah. you? Yeah. Why it do is. you do the skirts? It, well, you see, this guy, John, he made it for me and he said, Go, I said, I'm not wearing them. Oh. I'm never going to wear that. 
what he does. Yeah. But you have to be you're very butch when you go out in the skirt. So when I'm in the skirt, I'm very aware of being very butch. And Keith, I guess a great look from Keith, because he doesn't know whether to laugh or cry. To me, the spectacle is always subservient to the music. First, that has to be right. Then you can build all of this other stuff around it, as long as it doesn't interfere with the band's ability to deliver the sound. Richards and his guitar have delivered many of the classic Stones melodies, but his musical contributions have at times been eclipsed by his legendary drug habits. During the 70s, he developed a notorious appetite for heroin. Let's talk about the drug years for a minute. Yeah. How deep was it? How bad was it? How long was it? Uh, it was about 10 years of junkie. Yeah, I must say, out of all of the things, that one got had a pretty good hold of me for a while. And uh, I suppose, to a certain extent, drugs are an occupational hazard in the music business. How did you find the door out? Basically because uh, I, I had so much, I'd been busted so many times that I looked around and suddenly it was in my, I'm screwing up the stones, which is like, for me, unforgivable, let alone I'm screwing up my family. And I said, well, this is no longer just my private concern, you know, this is now, I've got to, you know, and I've just got to stop. You've, you've had a, a hard life. You've lived on the edge. Yes, yeah, some people would say I've had it easy, you know, and that I just made it hard for myself, and maybe, maybe that's true. Richards was not the only stone who had a problem with drugs. I had an awful dabble with them and got in terrible shape. You say an awful dabble. What were you doing? Um, amphetamine and heroin. It's a bit of contradictory in terms, but that's how I was living, and it's really bad for you. Up and down. Yeah. And I thought I was being normal. I forgot that I was doing, taking this. So drinking just becomes something to wash it down with. And I nearly lost everything. Charlie talked today about his problem with with drugs. In the early 80s, that was a problem for you. And mm -hmm. Keith was helpful, instrumental in bringing you out of that. How did you get out of it? No, Keith was too stunned to help me. <laughs> uh, it's up to the individual. You have to get out of it yourself. Some people get out of it quick. Others take many years. Like Mick Jagger. Although heroin wasn't his drug of choice, there were many others. You had a reputation of being on the edge, of pushing the envelope, yeah. of excess. Yeah, uh, and, and I did it for a very long time, and then come to a point where you go, well, I did it now, I think I have to sort of watch it, because I prefer to be able to do what I do for longer. It's very dull being, you know, you think that you're having a good time, but you're really just a slave to something. How long did it take you to realize that? About 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> On a quick study. <laughs> in spite of their history with drugs, in spite of each other, in spite of age, the stones roll on. If you're out there still doing what you do and honing it down and, and still bringing out new stuff and laying it on them and and you're doing it for the same reason that you did it when you started because you love it and you feel like there's loads more in there to come out then it's got to be you know who want to get off that bus <laughs> 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 